everyone. Happy Lammas to you. We're still in the Lammas period. Uh, for us in the old days, we celebrate on the eve of Lammas. Oops, did I whiz there? Um, right, so happy Lammas to you. I'm going to say it again. And in the old days, we celebrate on the eve of Lammas, which would be the 31st of August. And then Lammas Day is for us the first. But we're still in the period, uh, usually like with moon periods, it goes on three days before, three days after. And so you have a seven day period of which Lammas, the middle, is like the centre. So you're sort of going up and then down. And we're in the downward arc of it now. But that's okay. We're still in the period. And happy Lammas. If you have my, la my newsletter, you'll know that I'm very into the harvesting and that John Barleycorn has particularly come up for me this year. It doesn't always, every year, but this year he's very, very strong. John Barleycorn, the man, the man God, who gives his life for the land and who is the land who is the barley that has grown up for our beer and our whiskey and then is put back into the soil again so that we grow a good harvest next year. Now, nowadays people say, oh, you're placating the gods by making a sacrifice. No, that's not how it was. It's how modern thinking likes to think of it. Um, we've got to placate somebody. An awful lot of modern life, if you think about it, is about placating. So, hi Karen, happy Lammas to you, my dear. Great to see you. And a lot of modern life is about placating. And you look at your own life and see how often you actually are involved in that, possibly unconsciously. But it's not how it was. Things were gifted. We gifted, we gained, and we gifted, we gifted, and we gained. It's exchange, this lovely figure of eight that is exchange all the way through. And the cards that came up for me today, and this is the old pack. This is not the Wildwood. This is the Greenwood Tarot, and was Green Woman and green man. Now, Cheska and Mark didn't have a John Barleycorn type figure, but these two express it. The green man with, wrong one, wrong one. I will get this. I can't back a car. I can back a car actually, but I can't do this. Anyway, um, green man is the one with the leaves coming out of his eyes and his ears and his nose and his hair. He is the wildwood. He is the forest. He is the land. He is the growing things. And in that way, he is John Barleycorn. And there he is in the cup, the cauldron at the bottom that is holding him. And he's holding it up. And he's holding everything. Now let's look at her. Now, she also has the leaves growing out of her mouth and eyes and ears and hair and everything. But she also holds the spiral. And she also holds, if you look, can you, am I doing this right? Can you see at the centre of her? Now, do you know what that is? You probably don't. If you come to Britain and you get the opportunity do go and visit what is called the White Horse of Uffington. The White Horse of Uffington. It's an ancient, ancient figure. And that is the horse's head and the horse's eye. Doesn't look much like a horse, does it? Actually, when you see the figure in the land, it looks much more like a dragon. And goodness me, what has Cheska put at the bottom of the card? But a dragon. And there also, get the light on it, is the tree who is the green man, 
who is with her, who is her guardian. So we have the land and the land's guardian, both entwined together, both being the whole. Which is what the John, John Barleycorn story is about. Now, in the newsletter, you'll find uh, there's links to the song and the way our Morris dancers, a really quite ancient tradition, how they do the dance for him. And at the end of the newsletter, there's a really funny play which one set of Morris dancers have put together, which is the story. And uh, it's a wonderful laugh, and it just shows how completely daft we are often in the old traditions and how much fun we have. So, we have John Barleycorn. And he is sown into the ground. The rains come, water him, he grows up, he grows tall, he grows a beard, as the wheat does, the barley does. And then he's cut down and bound up. Now we used to do um, not hay bales, but hay stooks and corn stooks, which is sort of like a, a tall pyramid of hay. And then it, you bound it around the middle and you stood them all up. Uh, not anymore because everything's tractors. But, so that is what that verse refers to. And then he's taken in and he's threshed, which is the crab tree sticks, and to get the grain out. And the grain is then rolled between two stones, which is the miller's job, to get the barley out of the husks so that we can use it. And then he's made into beer and whiskey. We drink him. And what used to happen when I first, or when the family first moved to the little village on the edge of Exmoor where I grew up, they still ploughed with horses there, which is, if you've never seen it, it wasn't like in a, in a show, it was the real thing. This was done to plough the fields, not to show off to tourists. And the horses were all dressed up in their <laughs> harness with loads of brasses around them, which all have significance and are all about calling in the beings of the land, the gnomes, who will help the things grow, and to keep evil thought forms away. So we used the horses, and most of the village, or certainly the kids and you know mums and that, and some of the older people, would go for the first ploughing. And it happened just before or around Imok, that's around the 1st of February, and that's when we used to plough. Nowadays they sort of plough almost any time of the year in modern farming and with all sorts of results, which we'll talk about in a minute. But then we ploughed at Imok. And in the summer before, out of the corn stooks, um, out of the corn stalks rather, the corn bits, we made corn donnies. And one at least would have been kept all the year since Lamas ran to Imok again. And that doll was put into the first furrow. And that was John Barleycorn being ploughed back into the land and gifted. And it was symbolic and it held the spirit of why we all felt this good harvest. Come on, let's go for it. And it was lovely. I, I think some people still do do that. Uh, here in Britain, but it's not well known and it's not done much because it takes time and it means you have to wait and walk about and blah, 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 blah. And nobody has any time anymore, which is another thing to think about. But we used to do it. And I'm very glad that I was able to actually experience that for a couple of years. And then it stopped gradually. It sort of fell away as people gave up on the horses and took on with the tractors and everything like that. But it did happen. And that was, let me think, that year would have been about 1956, 57 and 58. So actually not that long ago. So 
My traditions are still there. Anyway, that was how we did John Barleycorn. And it's about giving back, as I said. Now, in Britain and in Scandinavia and in lots of places in Europe, we have found sacrificial bodies. The most famous one in Britain is probably Lindau Mann, who got the nickname of Pete Marsh because he was found in a marsh in a bog up in Cheshire. And his, he still confuses archaeologists, at least officially, because it's very hard to say. But he was, a, he was a sacrifice, and it looks like, since there are no defensive wounds anywhere on him, that he was a willing sacrifice. Now, as I say in the newsletter, I'm not made of that stuff, but I have actually known people who are. So he was the John Barleycorn who was given. And again, it wasn't to placate this was gifting back and someone who was willing to give their whole life for their community and for the land. And he died the triple death, which is right through stories all around the world and particularly strong in Europe. And in his case, the triple death was he was hit on the head, on the top, uh, with an axe, an arrow bladed axe. It went right in. Um, that probably did it. But after that, he was then strangled with a very special cord, which is still around his neck, so the archaeologists have been able to see what it is. And then his throat was cut, but he's really well dead by then. And then he was placed in the marsh, in the water, in the bog. Now, in those days, we used to bury people in the fetal position, you know, curled up, not all straight out like they do nowadays. But as you came out of the womb, curled up, and how you were in the womb, so you went back into the womb again, curled up, in the fetal position. And they placed him there. And they were able to examine his stomach and examine what he had eaten, uh, which is quite, you know, interesting, because he'd had a very special meal of grains and particular meats and things like that. And he'd had a special drink, as far as they can see. And at least one of the ingredients in the drink was mistletoe. Now, mistletoe, as you probably know, it's been very significant for all the people in whose lands mistletoe grows as a significant herb that is about, it is about birthing and rebirth. And it's a very sacred herb. So, all makes you think, doesn't it? I'm not suggesting we should go back to sacrificing, or that people should self-sacrifice in this way. But I'm saying, this is where the idea comes from. We actually have a much better way of doing it. Um, well, I don't know, a much more acceptable way of doing it now, and I certainly do it, and hopefully quite a lot of you do too, it's called composting. And uh, I'm, I've been heavily into that around this season, partly because lots of things grow in the garden and they're going over now and they need to be either cut down or removed, and both in the vegetable garden and out in the flower garden. And then their remains goes into the compost heap. And it goes through the year, and at the end of the year, it will be soil again, which is yay, because I eat quite a lot from my garden. I'm lucky I've got one that's big enough. But even so, if it's your flower garden, and you're still eating from it in a sense because it's giving to your senses, and it's giving you pleasure of scent and beauty and colour, and you give it back again to the garden. So, and I mean, I take roses from my bushes and bring them into the house and they just scent up the room and it's beautiful. But I give them back through the compost. And hopefully we're all doing that because that is exchange again. We're taking and we're giving. We're giving and we're taking. And the old ways are about that exchange 
about working with and enabling that exchange all the time. It's not about sucking up, it's not about placating, it's not about keeping the gods happy in case they do something horrible to you. Actually, in my experience, the gods and other world and all the other worldly beings actually have far too much life going on to them and looking after the world and the cosmos to be bothered with messing about with poking humans. So, <laughs> get over yourself, you're not that important. <laughs> it really is, you're giving because you've been gifted. Lamas is very much about that for me, about this fair exchange, which is one of the roots of all of our work. Hi Pam. Um, so there we are, we're into composting. Now that took me out of the stuff that I did in the newsletter, um, but we're starting to get a lot of butterflies here now in the garden. It's absolutely lovely, I adore butterflies, and I try to plant for them. So I've been looking at how I can improve the garden and how I can work with it, and what it wants, because of how high we are, we're, we're 500 foot up, um, we're in a, a stony, rocky land rather than a sort of deep earth land. Um, doesn't hold the water very well. So how does the land want me to work with it now? It's actually very different to all the land I've gardened on previously. So it's you know quite sort of learning curves like that, getting the hang of it. And how do I help butterflies? Now, Sorry, but one of the things that we do nowadays, and this is really quite shocking when you realise it, is modern farming. Yeah, maybe it feeds us, some of it very badly, if it's all full of chemicals and muck and pushed and done. But it takes from the rest of nature. And one of the things that it takes from is butterflies. Now, I don't know whether you know, but butterflies, a lot of butterflies, and I'll read about the species in, that happened in Britain, a lot of butterflies actually lay their eggs on tall grass stems. Now, that could be really tall. You know, I mean, some grass grows to sort of two and a half feet, sometimes even more. And a lot of butterflies lay their eggs on that. Think about that next time you mow the lawn worth it. And of course farmers do because they're cutting silage for the animals to feed on and it just, phew, nowhere to lay my eggs, phew, nowhere to lay my eggs. I find that a bit staggering. Now, the butterflies in Britain who lay on grass are the speckled wood, the wall butterfly, the gatekeeper, meadow brown, the marbled white, beautiful that one, the ringlet, the small heath, the large and the small skippers, the Essex skipper. That's actually 10 species. That's a lot of butterfly species that we just take. We just take their habitat away. We take their, the place where they would lay their eggs away in order to grow food for ourselves. And when we take it like to grow wheat and corn and barley and all this kind of thing, that's not what they, they lay their eggs on. Just because it's a long stalk, that's the work for them. It's a grass that they take. And my nose is really itching today. And when we take the grass and cut it for silage, again we're taking it. But taking it for food, for corn, growing fields of wheat, for bread and all the stuff, then we're taking their habitat. Now, let me find this again. I'm getting to really learn about grasses. <coughs> I've known about grasses, but I've not known species very well. 
and I'm really got into it since we've moved to Shropshire. I was in it a bit in Herefordshire, but not as much as I intend to be here. And just some of the grasses <coughs> that um, butterflies use are Coxfoot, that's a tall one with a lovely head. Common Bent, that's a shorter one. Cooch Grass, now, here the gardener's shrieking. I can't have cooch grass, it's going to invade my whole garden, it's going to ruin everything, and it's going to feed butterflies. Mm. And common cow wheat grass, that's like a wheat, it is one of the early wheats, and that grows. Creeping soft grass, that's really beautiful. Worries everybody because it's creeping, <gasps> it's going to invade. And early hair grass, that's another beautiful one. And tufted hair grass too. And Yorkshire fog. And I'm lucky I've got a bit of Yorkshire fog. It's quite rare now in Britain. And I've got a bit in the garden. So it's like, don't touch that with a mower. And I'm telling my husband, no mower. You know, we only mow paths anyway in our garden. We don't mow most of the, most of the grass. But we've got a, a, a cross set of paths like that, which lead the directions where we go to sit around the four corners of the garden. So he's quite good like that. He's, he's not doing too badly. And then we get into what are we going to plant in this garden of ours? And you can do an awful lot even if all you have is a sort of town garden or a suburban garden. But it may not be what the garden centre is selling. Some will. I mean Budlier and Lilac, butterflies love those wonderful food. Lavender you'll get, honeysuckle. You'll probably get ivy, but then you'll get in a panic about it's going to kill other things. It actually doesn't. You need to learn about what ivy does before you decide it's definitely going to kill something. Um, but ivy and holly, I mean, they are really good for the blue butterflies, and they're getting really rare. And hi, Lynn. Lamas to you, too. And bird's foot trefoil. Now that's a grass plant, it grows in amongst the grasses and it's quite hard to grow and you have to take care and you mustn't mow all the time. So all this sort of lovely short green velvet grass for bowling greens and all that is like, no, we're not going there. Dog violet, I've got that, it's beautiful. But you need to let it go. If you leave it alone and don't mess with it and don't try and weed it too much, just stop it being suffocated, then it will spread. And it's beautiful. The scent, of course, is lovely. And again, butterflies like it. Thyme and marjoram probably grow those. They're really good. So is mint. Uh, most of the herbs are that we grow. Um, so if you grow for cooking, you're probably also growing for butterflies but don't take all the flowers okay leave some be careful how you take it rosemary is another one and sage and, and lovely flowers don't keep cutting it down so you can get enough for the kitchen you will have enough you don't need to grasp you will have enough so allow some exchange allow some share that's the other thing share. Wild strawberry. Lots of people in Britain and possibly elsewhere too hate it because it oh it's so invasive I haven't got anything but wild strawberry and it's just covering everything. So what? I had a lot of it in places in the last garden and I'm hoping I will again in this garden. And A, they're absolutely the most gorgeous things in the world to eat. Um, but you're not going to get punnets for you're going to be out and eat a few every day. And I used to go out and eat a few as I was moving around. Again, don't be greedy. Share. And, oh dear, problem. Thistles. <gasps> There's a thistle in my, bed, my rose bed. Pull it out immediately. Ooh. Again, yes. You're taking food. You're also taking food from birds. So we have goldfinches here. And I keep thistles and teasels in the garden. And 
they're now going because the thistles are starting to seed and you see these beautiful little birds, tiny little birds, and they're perching on the thistle and they're pecking the seeds out and food. And I like the colour of thistles actually. I love that magenta purpley colour. I think it's beautiful. But, oh, oh, it's going to spoil my pansies or whatever it was I bought from the garden centre. So, you know, yay. And so what? It's going to be fine. Oh, I've just seen another one. Docks. <gasps> I can't have docks in my garden. <gasps> Um, I've actually got quite a few. I do move, you know, sort of say, actually, just not there, you know, can we be over here? Um, usually get there in the end. Not quite quickly, really, because I've only been here a year. And they're beautiful plants for the flowers, again, they're going to give food for the butterflies and food for the birds. And they're going to help you with another plant you're going to have to grow, too. Um, every time you are getting in amongst the nettles because you've got too many and uh, there'll be a dock growing nearby, just rub your hand with it and it'll feel a lot better instantaneously. So docks and nettles. Yeah. Now, who's it who likes nettles particularly? I bet you're going to like these butterflies too. That's the peacock. That's such a beautiful butterfly. Big, dark, black underwings and beautiful spots on the top. Red Admiral, another beautiful one. The Comma, I just adore them. They're the ones with sort of frilly edged wings, uh, sort of golden orangey brown and gold and dark spots on them. And they're so lovely. And the small tortoise shell, and they're really beautiful too. And they all like nettles, and their caterpillars eat nettles. So I'm organising a nettle part of my garden. And, well, several actually. And one of them, is we've got a our front door faces south and we've got a lovely view of our pointy mountain the caradoc and when we sit there and there's a hedge which is a lovely holly hedge it's really great and I, it's it's got several nests in it at the moment and yeah i have to be careful where i walk because i keep, 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 keep. and mother bird comes yeah get out of my nest you know and um it's quite funny because it reminds me of something, I think I put it up on the, on the uh, Facebook page here, web, uh, Wise Woman's, that my friend Fiona keeps geese and she, they've just recently had goslings and the goslings think Fiona's great because she brings them food and she talks to them and strokes their beaks and things. And so they came charging up to her one day, um, which was really cute, and she was hoping to be able to uh, video them. Um, and immediately afterwards comes mummy and daddy geese, wings out, and they're big and they're fierce. And uh, in Goose, as she said, she was sure they were saying to her, Get away from my children, you filthy pervert! <laughs> and I feel a little bit like that when I'm going past and I've got a robin and some sparrows in the, in the holly hedge, and I'll get out of my nest, don't you touch my kids. And it was a very protective. Why not? And I'm sorry. And I back away carefully. And um, that's fine. I don't need to do things there. And the babies will have, they, you know, will fledge and they will be gone. And then I can, I get my time in there. So again, it's exchange and sharing all the time. So anyway, my nettle patch. So there's the holly hedge and there's a lot of nettles growing up from there. And I've got to check just when um, the caterpillars will chrysalis um, of the peacock and red admiral, the common and the tortoise shell. And after that, I'm going to ask Paul to strim them down to about yay high. And I can get in there because I'm going to mix things up in there. At the moment, it's all dark green and a bit dull when we sit and look at it. But if I put foxgloves in, oxeye daisies, they're lovely thugs, they, they'll handle the nettle any time. Um, comfrey, a bit further forward, it's shorter, but it's it's great. Uh, I've got lots of the Vigna bonariensis, that's the, the tall one with the lovely purple flowers, and the, the white butterflies, most of the white butterflies and the brimstones really like it. So they can go in and they'll be taller than the nettles. And there's some mallow growing there anyway, so I just need to encourage that and throw some more seeds in. Got a lot of poppies last year and this year 
and they're the lovely big pink ones and they go pink and purple and they're really beautiful so I've been collecting the seeds and chucking them in amongst the nettles and a lot will come up and I've also got a lot of calendula I use calendula anyway and it's great in salads apart from anything else apart from other uses so as they've been seeding it's but a bit further out because of course they're not going to grow us at all so I've got this sort of layering up of the hedge how to grow nettles and still like it and still have something pretty to look at it can be done it really can honestly it just requires a little bit of thinking and a little bit of asking your garden and a little bit of asking the plants and asking the birds and asking the butterflies and your garden spirit we talked about that a, a few a couple of months ago your garden spirit will help you but you do need to get in there and say um excuse me i was thinking of doing this how does it sound to you and you'll get the pictures and the, sometimes the words and all sorts of stuff and you go, oh oh i haven't thought of that that's a good idea when we first came here last year which was well, we actually moved in on the 5th of August, so we're going to have a big celebration uh, this year when we're around. But after that, I spent a lot of time sitting up where the pond is now, and just sitting with the garden and going, I sort of fancy some of this, how does that feel, and where would you like that? And sometimes I go, oh no, I don't want that. Um, and a lot of time I get, well, why don't you put that down there, or why don't you put that over there? And I've been gradually doing that. And where I have done it, it works. And another interesting thing with the garden and with working with the spirits and how things work out. As probably a lot of you know, I actually got to climb the Caradoc, my pointy mountain, uh, just before midsummer. Fantastic. I had to go up a very difficult way for all sorts of other reasons, which don't matter now. And three days later, my back and every rib in my body, um, both front and back, was like, ugh. I, I couldn't bend, I couldn't move, I didn't dare cough, if I sneezed, I screamed. And I was in excruciating pain. And of course, being me, I've been going to spend two or three hours in the garden every day. You just don't do it when your back and your ribs won't allow you to move. It's not possible. So the gardener sort of flattened me. I had lots of other things to do, which if you want to come and listen at seven o'clock tonight on Facebook Live, we'll be talking about because we've got a launch party for the site. Anyway, I was doing that. But of course I was not gardening. Once my shiatsu friend had sorted me out, and started to get me right again and I could actually move then I could go out in the garden I could actually walk around the garden without being terrified of falling over again and I could go and sit up by the pond put up I put up a video on that I've done a little video of the garden recently I'll put it up later and sit there and again sit with and look at the garden Wow. Well, lots of weeding that I thought I needed to do wasn't done, hadn't been done. But, my goodness, in the beds and the shrubbery and the sort of semi-wild beds where I thought I would do some weeding, then, wow, the number of different grasses. I was just talking to you about, that's how I've come to know, because I let them grow so they show themselves to me. They're not just little short one inch, two inch high green leaves. And they're beautiful. And there's some very pale, almost white ones. There's some deep brown golden ones. There's um, other ones that are green. There are other ones that are red. Oh, I hadn't known they were there. So having been flattened by various otherworldly beings, who thought I certainly didn't want to be doing what I thought I ought to be doing, I was able to see. I was able to see lots of different sorts of wildflower too. And we just grow yarrow for a pastime. Um, and there's all sorts of other things as well. 
and we grow an awful lot of the small hogweed. Now we grow too much of that, and so I was sort of worrying about it and sitting there um, by the pond and going, mm, that's really beautiful, do we want this? And they actually said, no, um, why don't you dig us up? And I said, well, I will when I can, which is probably going to start this week, because I'm feeling like it now. And they said, right, when you dig us up, there'll be a hole and there'll be earth. And so you've got lots of wildflower seeds, because I managed to get some um, earlier in the year. Put a few of those in each of the hole. And wild grass seeds too. Put a few of those in each of the hole. Ooh. Yeah. So I mean, I've been a gardener all my life. I, I've even, you know, been a, a posh show gardener and getting got medals from the Royal Horticultural Society at their Hampton Court show and things like that. But I'm still learning. That's great, actually. I like that. And it's showing me you don't need to do it like that. You don't need to do it like that. And you don't need to project plan it completely. Have an overall idea which I have, and I had, and that is forming and coming to life, but you don't have to push it. Wait and we'll show you what to do. Wait and we'll show you what to do. And that's been gorgeous and so good to feel. Especially this sort of like, you know, you've dug up a weed, so put some seeds in. Or maybe you've got some, I've got some verbena plants ready, you know, the tall ones and the medium-sized ones. Dig me up and put, put, a ver, put a verbena in there. Or put a hyssop in there. I've got some hyssop to go as well. And, oh, it's just great. It really is. And it's like, just to reverse back to these again, it's like the green woman and the green man are showing me, this is what we want. This will help us. This will help the birds and the bees and the pollinators and the other insects and the butterflies. It will all help the plants themselves. This is what will help. I'm really for that kind of thing. If you just think about it in biology, history, ecology terms, let alone bringing in all the things we know about, our Earth has been doing this for 4.56 or 7 billion years, billion years. Humans, humanoids and humans, have been on this planet for maybe 5 million. You do the maths of the difference. It's like, Puh. She knows what she's doing, Mother Earth. What we need to learn is to listen, and to hear and to try out what she says and to always always give back and give exchange when we get something we give it back we give something whether or not we've got anything we don't have to be that mean about things i've got some spare you have it that's how it is in the old ways and it's what the lady and the lord want of us yeah the lady and the lord mother mother earth and for us father son but also father greenwood father the wild things the live things the living things of our earth and we bring them together bring them together within us and within our consciousness all the time so that we're always asking and working. How's about you have a go at that, this Lammas, and start a new thing in your life? That you can actually go for this. You can grow all these wonderful plants. I mean, I even grow sacrificial cabbages in the sense of, in that I'm letting the butterflies lay their eggs on them. I'm not keeping them off. I shall have some cabbage for me, but they will also have some cabbage so that I will have butterflies again next year. I'm letting thistles come 
because they're really good for painted lady butterflies and they're beautiful butterflies and I've grown in my north fence which wasn't a hedge I put in a load of native trees and bushes that are all good again for birds and butterflies and the little critters that live in the bottom as well we can all do this and it's actually beautiful tell you one thing though you might upset all the shareholders who own all the amazing plant centers that you're supposed to be buying from me well tough <laughs> we can do it without and it'll be fine so give it a go this lammas have a wonderful lammas all of you hopefully that it, you know if it's still going on for me it's so nearly two o'clock but you're having a great lammas have a great celebration and think about what you can do to help butterflies and so everything else so take care everybody I'm gonna go and have a cup of tea as I always do you know that <laughs> it's the British thing we live on tea it is the total heal all for everything so I'm gonna have my cup of tea and maybe a biscuit or something and then back to work again but, as I said, I'll be back live tonight at 7pm, my time, work that out, and I'll be talking about what we've just opened and done, and about the deer trods, the deer trods time. So, look forward to seeing you then, if you're around, and in any case, this and all the Facebook Live videos are recorded, and they go up on the Wise Woman page, so that if you weren't able to be here, you can watch it later if you want to. So, bye for now. See you next Sunday. And see you at 7 o'clock tonight. Bye.